everyone. I'm Lily Herman, and I'm going to be your moderator for this very witchy panel. I'm a writer, editor, and digital strategist with work on the likes of Teen Vogue, Shondaland, and Refinery29, where I unpack the intersections of topics like politics, feminism, culture and books, but more importantly, on to what today's panel's about. Uh, the theme of our panel is Witches and Women Throughout the Ages, where we're exploring the enduring intrigue and heightened popularity of witches and witchcraft in books. So in other words, what do witches represent and why are we so drawn to them in an increasingly hostile world? Our panelists today have written about witches taking on powerful forces in a wide range of settings from 1895 France to present day Brooklyn, New York. So to kick us off here, I'd love for each of you to introduce yourselves and give a brief 20 to second synopsis of your latest book. And I can uh, you know, go through and, and popcorn around here. So first and foremost, Maggie, can you kick us off here? Sure. Um, I'm Maggie Takuda Hall. I'm the author of The Mermaid, The Witch, and the Sea, which is all the things that it promises on the tin, a kidnapped mermaid, um, a witch, clearly, uh, and the sea, who's a point of view character in the story. Um, but really, it's about two kids who've had their entire lives dictated to them, and for the first time in their lives, they're trying to take their destinies into their own hands. Amazing. Sophie. Hi, so my name is Sophia Scavas. I'm the author of The Witches of Brooklyn, and this is a mid-grade graphic novel, um, the first one of a series, and it tells the story of this little girl that you see on the cover, Effie, who, after the death of her mom, comes to live with her aunt in Brooklyn and her friend, and she will soon discover that they are not just your herborist and acupuncturist of the neighborhood, like just like that, they're witches. And if you will soon discover that she has power herself. Incredible. Uh, Alexis. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Alexis, and I am the author of The Year of the Witching. It is an adult dark fantasy slash horror novel um, about a young girl who lives in a very rigid puritanical society. Um, and she has an encounter with some witches in the dark woods that surrounds her home. And through them, she uncovers dark secrets about the ruling church and herself. Love it. Uh, Constance. Constance Sayers. I am the author of A Witch in Time, um, which is uh, a uh, adult dark fantasy uh, book about um, a woman who goes out on a date in modern day um, Washington, D.C. and finds out that she was cursed back in um, 1895 in uh, Belle Epoque, Paris and to, to relive multiple lives. And so it takes place in Hollywood 1930s as well as Belle Epoque, France in 1896, 1895. Um, and it also takes place in Taos in 1970 and then in modern day Washington. So it's quite, quite the adventure there. <laughs> and, wrong. Uh, yes. <laughs> and Alex. Uh, I'm Alex e. Hero, and I don't have a copy of my book to hold up right now, and I'm feeling really intimidated already. Uh, it's The Once and Future Witches, uh, and the pitch for it is really quick. It's just suffragists, but witches. That's it. That's the whole book. Uh, so it, it's kind of just the three sisters who are involved in like the American women's suffrage movement, except they make it into uh, an American witches movement. I love it. Perfect. So an obvious place for us to start is how did each of you decide to write about witches and what drew you to witchcraft and its very long and complex global history? Do you want us to start like whoever? Yeah. Oh yeah, feel free to go. Oh, okay, okay. So uh, I can go first uh, yeah. if, if you want. Um, I mean, I've always been in love with witches since I'm a little girl, you know, I grew up with all these like anime and manga and magical girls. So that was always had an appeal for me when I was a kid and growing up, witches started to have a different meaning, like which means like independent woman, really, and are usually like very strong female character uh, who are doing some kind of magic, which is super cool. And they're also, I love the fact that they're connected with uh, their spiritual, spiritual, sorry, self, as well as nature. I think that's amazing. And um, yeah, and very intuitive um, people. So that's why I decided, I mean, yeah, love story here. 
I'll just jump in and kind of add that I totally, totally get that. Like we've all grown up on like witchy media, I think. But I'm also kind of, so I was surprised in the process of writing this book to realize how much witchcraft is kind of connected to like anger for me. Like it's a, it's a, it's an angry vibe. And uh, it was a good time to write an angry book for me. I'm sure many of you might feel similarly. Uh, And in particular, it's that sense of like, I actually read this in a review of Naomi Alderman's The Power with Kamal Al-Mutar's review where she was talking about how she used to have this fantasy in middle school that she like had an electric current through her body and that it could like shock away anyone who touched her. And I realized reading that, that I had like the exact same fantasy at certain points in my life. And so I think that the whole appeal of witching, right, is that like, if your body or personhood for whatever reason is perceived as something that makes you vulnerable, I think the idea of having this innate power that makes you dangerous is a totally compelling fantasy. So that's where, that's how I got here. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Super similarly, um, so The Mermaid, The Witch, and the Sea is very much about colonialism and sort of uh, the violence that patriarchy does on a state level and on a personal level. Um, And so the witch being standing in opposition to that sort of representing power that uh, is considered particularly threatening to that sort of establishment was very pleasing to me. And, you know, since I wrote most of the first draft after the 2016 election, like the appeal of witches seemed extra strong to me. I had a really oh, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, I had a really similar experience in that like I was raised in a pretty conservative religious household. I was homeschooled um, my entire life, which was great. I liked being homeschooled. but um, through those experiences, I, I had some um, kind of brushes with more fundamentalist like parts of Christianity. And so I think that a lot of my fascination with witches, which started when I was very young, stemmed from that. Um, they seemed like this kind of alternative way to access a power that I didn't have within um, the environment um, that I occupied at that time. And so I think that that really fueled my obsession with witches. So yeah, like um, all of that anger and like all of this like desire to have power or just desire to kind of be in possession of myself um, kind of came out in my, my book. I definitely, I mean, can really identify with that. I think in A Witch in Time, I was really focused on the powerlessness of women Um, particularly back in like 1895, uh, you know, France, which was the time I was looking at, I remember um, a historian telling me that a woman could not walk down the street by herself um, uh, because she, and be a real lady. And so you had these kind of just incredible constraints. And I I like the idea, you know, I kind of grew up on the Samantha Stevens kind of, you know, bewitched. I mean, it's, you know, I'm I'm a child of the seventies, but I really like this idea of transcending um, that powerlessness with magic. And I think that that is, you know, um, the rest of of my book also looks at different periods of time where women had different, you know, kind of historic powerless moments and how um, this one woman is able to kind of transcend that, you know, that powerlessness. So I I definitely, you know, Alexis here with there's that that whole thing about witches and power and powerlessness, I think is, is a really important theme. It's actually a perfect segue into my next question, which is, that given the very long history of witchcraft in in a number of places around the world, how do you go about researching your books? Like, how does one even research witches? Does anyone have any fun stories? Uh, And also, what made you decide, um, for for any of you to answer this, what made you decide on the time period and setting for your books? Again, whether that's present day, whether it was, it's a historical book, whether it's here in the, you know, in the U.S. or or elsewhere, Um, how did you uh, do that research and, and figure out those initial frameworks and anyone can kick us off. In terms of, I'll start, in terms of research, um, I don't know if, if all of you will sh- share this with, but I, you know, I ended up, you know, I do a lot of, you know, research on, you know, films and books. And there was a period of time between the demonology and the witch books that my Amazon like suggestion cart looked like I was like a really disturbed person. <laughs> and, you know, um, but, you know, I just, I, I just have like volumes. And then I actually went to France and I, you know, because it was set in France, I, I really felt the need that I had to go where I wanted to go but I had never really written a period piece and I was writing up until that point novels that were um, you know very contemporary 
and I wanted to try out the idea of could I, you know, um, you know, go to this world. Um, and and I just feel very safe with you know with research and having my head in a book. So for me, that was really where I started. Um, you know, researching both witches, but then also the time periods I was putting, um, you know, putting my characters in. Incredible. I mean, my book is. Um a second world fantasy, so it's not in any particular moment in time. It's also not in any particular uh, country that is exactly familiar to us. I tried to sort of blend nations. Um, but for research, because it was second world fantasy, I felt like I got to treat world history a bit like a buffet and just sort of take the things that I was really interested in um, and put them together. Like, for example, one of the details that I absolutely stole from a ghost tour in New Orleans um, was uh, the idea of young women being shipped off to meet a husband uh, with all of her things packed into a casket as her family's way of being like, no, we're for real when we say till death do us part. And this is like, we're really making this gesture. So you even have the box to bury her in. It's perfect, mm -hmm. complete. Oh um, and so in my book, Evelyn, who's one of the two main characters is shipped off to meet her husband in a casket. Um, and unlike in New Orleans, where that was sort of like the beginning of the vampire myth there, because beautiful young girls would show up with caskets and it was very unnerving. <laughs> um, Evelyn's really just off to go meet a husband she has zero interest in, not only because she's queer, but also because she's 16 and not really interested in getting married. Yeah, I bet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, I I can go. Um, I'm, I drew a graphic novel, so in, in my case, you know, research were like mostly like sketching and drawing, and um, it took me quite, I really wanted my witches to, to take their story to take place in Brooklyn because back then I have been living in, I mean, I lived in Brooklyn for 13 years and I, I Brooklyn forever. Um, and I wanted them to be like, you know, in a real setting because that's my favorite kind of stories, you know, to just like include magical fluids into reality. I think that's amazing. And um, yeah, it took me quite some time to find a place where I wanted to set them because I couldn't see them in a modern building or like even a brownstone. But um, but then I discovered Desmus Park, like all these like quirky Victorian houses that are just like, that's here, that's where I want them to be. So, yeah. Amazing. And then Alex or Alexis, anything to add? Um, I, I kind of, I, I did similar research to everyone else, kind of like just picking and choosing um like the things that i was interested in kind of following my interest in that way but i also kind of dabbled a little bit in, in witchcraft which i don't know if i i recommend i just um you know i don't recommend opening doors that you don't know how to close but i was young when i wrote this book and i was kind of like exploring my own faith and my own spirituality so apart from like the historical research i did i i did kind of like cast a few spells and my dad at one point was worried that i cursed the house or like welcomed a ghost in because like books started flying off the walls and like like glass started breaking and it was kind of it was um yeah it was an interesting little experience so oh. yeah i want to but, read that memoir immediately yeah, <laughs> yeah it was an dude the one. book about like a woman who's writing a book about witches but accidentally curses her own house i would read that right would absolutely yes. read that. <laughs> for it love it I'm just going to make a quick note about that. Uh, so I would just say that all of your research sounds a lot more uh, organized than mine, because what I did was pitch a book as suffragettes but witches, and then realized that those are two enormous, messy things that I was trying to put together in one novel link thing. Because, like, you know, the women's movement is, like, multiple centuries, multiple continents, huge, diffuse, diverse, different groups of people who are often fighting with each other. Like, there's no coherent, easy way to summarize that. And then witchcraft, I had, like, you know, a very Western narrative in my head of what that was. But as soon as you look into, like, if you broaden even slightly your definitions of, like, magical practices, it just becomes enormous. Yeah. Like, every culture has had ways of accessing what we might call the supernatural. And so... I floundered for a really long time. And that's A, why the book is 500 and something pages. I'm really sorry about that. And B, <laughs> it's why I, I departed a lot more from actual history than I ever had before. Like I liked my writing to be like, it could be a real history. And there's just like magic slunk in on the edges. And then in this one, it's like, no, I made up a whole new city and 
a whole new cast of characters and kind of mashed it all together into one. <laughs> and so all of you um, have built in your books these incredibly complex women and girls, and which I, I obviously think is incredible for many reasons. So how do you create these characters who are you know, a mix of vulnerable and strong and interesting and fun and, and in despair sometimes, you know, all at the same time? And how did you decide what being a witch or being witchy would mean to your specific you know, protagonist or protagonists, plural? I can go first again. <laughs> yes, go for it. Um, that's my little magical uh, story. I think intuition, there's something very magical into like the concept of in, having an intuition, having, having an inspiration. And, uh, and it, the old like book, the old like which is story started with one sketch, you know, like just like I didn't know what I was doing and just through that sketch, I was like, oh, I like that character. And uh, it was like one of the main character interacting with another one. And it kind of stuck with me, you know, like uh, like an imaginary friend. The character stayed with me, and we started like kind of interacting. And uh, yeah, little by little, you know, other characters came in the picture, and uh, and the story uh, took shape. So yeah, that's that's more or less how it happened. Well, I am um, my uh, character of Juliet is is sadly based upon my own grandmother, who um, in 1920 was walking home and was attacked by three men. And in 1920, when that happens, um, she was sent off and sent away, um, you know, and, and it was in the, on the, in the newspapers and it was, you know, I mean, she was ruined, I mean, technically. I mean, you know, like, you know, back in the day, that's kind of how they perceived it. So she wasn't going to get a husband. She wasn't going to be marriageable. And so they sent her off to be a housekeeper um, for a 70 year old man who would ultimately become my grandfather. Um, and if anyone has read A Witch in Time, that's, there's, there's that moment that I just always remember hearing the story about her, you know, going to, you know, to live with my, who would become my grandfather and thinking to myself, God, how she must have felt being shipped off in 1920 after this terrible traumatic thing happened to her and having no idea what road was, was she going to get in something worse or what was the, what was the next journey for her? And that really anchored the beginning character um, that I had who really suffers a lot of trauma. Um, and I think that kind of comes by, and I think it is my anger about, you know, kind of the situation of women back at that time where they had very little options other than, you know, a, a good marriage for themselves. And, you know, so that's, that's I, I think, you know, and I, then I tried to anchor that then as she grew and moved through these different lives and took on different personalities, but, you know, kind of was always the same, you know, through thread of the same person. Um, so that was, you know, a little bit of my story uh, about the character development of my, my characters. Um, I have a witch and sort of like a witch's apprentice. One of the main characters is sort of studying under a, an established witch in the middle part of my book. Um, and the established witch practices like narrative magic. I was trying to, so I'm Jewish and I really wanted my witch to be Jewish as well, in a <laughs> sense. Um, and so she uh, creates her magic by telling stories and making them true. Um, and I think that that's also, a, it was a reaction to watching the election and seeing stories have this incredible power regardless of their basis in reality and feeling like that was like a horrible kind of magic. Mm -hmm. um, and so she practices in that as well, um, but she's doing it consciously. She's doing it in this sort of interest of upsetting imperial forces as opposed to imposing them. And so I thought of it as being sort of like two sides of the same coin, using the same kind of magic, but in different ways. And the kid who's studying underneath her is gender fluid, which was also a choice I made purposefully because I do think that we tend to talk about witches as women, mm -hmm. which uh, obviously has like a long history. And I think that we tend to ignore the places where gender is more liminal and where it's non-binary. Um, and so I wanted the character who becomes a witch in this book to be to represent that to represent the way that uh, this kind of magic and this association that we have with taking away power from men and from for finding it within themselves doesn't have to be a cis endeavor. 
I love that. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's incredible. <laughs> Alex or Alexis, anything to, to add? <laughs> the last two again. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, it's fine. It's for the record, here. it's not actually because I'm a shy person. It's because I'm the kind of person who could absolutely trample a conversation at any moment. I'm, I'm trying to be better than I am. Uh, so my, like, my women characters, like where they came from, is basically I was reading a lot of witchcraft stories and stuff like that and histories and kind of running in again and again to that maiden mother crone archetype, and mm -hmm. which is one that I hate obviously it's terrible like defining women and their value based on like their reproductive status is gross but i actually also kind of like it it's just very like it has this resonance to me and i was at a moment in my life where i just i had a newborn and i was feeling like i was kind of in a transitional point and all this you know i was having feelings um so i kind of made my three main characters to hopefully subvert those archetypes but in other ways fulfill them but I hope we get to talk more about the, the binariness of witchcraft, and I'm, I'm really interested in that. <laughs> Too. Um, with, with Emmanuel, uh, my main character, I, um, I was kind of fascinated by this idea of like seduction and sin and temptation. So I think that what lends her this inherent witchiness is that she lives in this uh, theocratic society that's ruled by this church and uh, a prophet who's kind of a tyrant, very much a tyrant, um, and she feels kind of lured to the dark, and it's almost um, it's almost like a romance, uh, and she's kind of grappling with her own sin and her own um, idea of herself and, and what she feels and what she desires, and so I think that that's kind of how I shaped her character and how I developed this kind of witchy inclination that she has. Awesome. And speaking to this idea of what does it even mean to be a witch and, and our conceptions of, of witchiness are very, um, very Western, very cis, usually also uh, can be kind of straight, which sounds strange. Uh, but so all of you have elements of feminism in particular in your books, and they come across in different ways, whether it's through um, the power of, of one woman or, or a group of women and other people together. So how is you know, is is witchiness or witchcraft or witches in general a powerful way to explore feminism for women and girls of all ages? And what do you hope readers take away from your novels in terms of how they look at at feminism and how how to push forward? And it's a very say, big question. I wasn't yeah. thinking about my book in terms of feminism. I was thinking about it in terms of kids. Uh, what I hope that they take away from it, because it's a young adult book, mm -hmm. um, is that the power to kind of create the story of who you are is a story that only you are allowed to tell. Mm -hmm. um, and that being a source of great power. And I think that that becomes incidentally feminist, because if you are like a true intersectional feminist, the idea being that there's choice and that who you are isn't defined by your genitals or anything like that. And so it's less about girls and women and more about the opportunity to be the fullest version of yourself and having that not be an impediment to your success or your ambition or your love. Mm -hmm. I agree very much with that. I mean, I didn't start the Witches of Brooklyn thinking that I would make like a feminist pamphlet for uh, mid-grades. Um, not at all, but it's true that just showing old women living together, no men around, independent, and uh, you know, by example, I guess maybe it's uh, it's feminist, but uh, I didn't have that in the back of my head really. But it is powerful, powerful women and and strong girls, um, you know, who are like yeah, making like room for themselves in the world, definitely. I, I definitely think. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I definitely think for, for um, my book, I kind of stumbled into it by accident. Um, again, just because, you know, starting at the beginning where, you know, you have these constraints, um, you know, my character is basically saved by a demon. And so she needs rescuing. Um, my hope is, though, by the end of the book, you know, and then in, in Hollywood in the 1930s, I thought, thought that was a very interesting time to explore also, because you have the creation of the ideal kind of like film woman uh, being, you know, kind of 1934, 1933 pre Hayes Code, that was kind of the beginning. And so I have my character move from Belle Epoque, France to there in her next life. And in each of her lives, though, as we move on, and then even in 1970, um, she begins to not need the, uh, the, the savior, the rescuer, who happens to be the, a demon. And so by the end, I, my hope is that she has transcended 
him. And even though it's not 100% perfect, but we, you know, we certainly have, have ways to go, it isn't what it was before. And so, I mean, that's what I hope people take away from the book. And I, even in the, my, my, my new book, it's the same thing, which is at the end, the, my, my characters have pulled through and pushed through on the other side to um, you know, kind of reclaim themselves um, without being saved by anything or anyone. So, um, I had I had a similar experience. Uh, weirdly, I feel like my book is oftentimes pitched as like a, a feminist fantasy novel, and, and, and it is that. Um, but when I was first writing it, I, I didn't really realize the story that I was telling. So I was just kind of experiencing things organically through my main character. And and the only goal that I really remember having in that first draft was that I wanted to see a witch story with someone who looked like me because it was just something that I didn't encounter very often. And it was amazing how, as I told the story through the perspective of you know a biracial Black character, um, all of these tropes that I was so familiar with were kind of upended and changed just by telling the story through a new perspective. And so I think um, even above like feminism or anything like that, I would just love for people to kind of um, experience a story as someone who doesn't have power, looking at a character who doesn't have power, kind of claiming it um, without apology. Um, and, and that inspired me while I was writing the book. And, and I hope that's like a takeaway um, for you know everyone who reads it. Yeah, I will say that mine, uh... I knew it was feminist from the beginning. It's very explicitly, like once you're writing about the women's movement, like you're extremely conscious of what that means and like which women's movement are you talking about and whose women's movement and all this stuff. Um, and so a lot of the decisions in it are, are very deliberate. Um, and if there is a lesson to take away from it, it's that um, actual social movements are really, really slow and they're about collectivism and they're about very tiny incremental successes and, and they're messy and extremely diverse and kind of take the biggest possible tent. So that's, that's where I ended up with it. <laughs> Amazing. And so I can't believe our time is almost up, which is wild to me. So I have one last question for if, if maybe two people want to answer this. It's a question that I feel like comes up in, in uh, normal Comic-Con panels and someone in the audience always asks it, which is what advice do you have for people who are thinking about writing about witches or witchcraft in their own stories? So again, if maybe two people have, have kind of advice for, for uh, writers or, or whoever. Mine's really short, so you could probably do three. It's just Perfect. that your witch doesn't have to be like everyone else's. You have an opportunity to make something new. Mm. Love it. Anyone else? One or two other people. No, I would say explore and read as much as you can. I mean, this has been mentioned before, but you know, witchcraft and witches around the world take so many different forms. And uh, I recently, I mean, I'm late in the game, but I just recently read Akata Witch, and it's just like such an amazing book. I feel like it was like mind blowing. All these like insects everywhere. I was like, wow. So yeah, read, read, explore. That would be my advice. All righty. So just to make sure you all have time to to plug what's going on with all of you, uh, would love to hear from everyone in terms of if there's any teasers in, with your book or what's coming out. If you want to um, plug if your book has come out or is about to come out, you know, reminding everyone to order a pre-order. Um, and lastly, too, if you could say where where folks can find you on the Internet, that'd be great. So I'll um, I can on people randomly here. Um, let's, let's sort of start with Alex. <laughs> Alex, where, where can people find you on the internet? What should they be going out and buying? All uh, of that so goodness. The Once in Future Witches comes out on October 13th, which is a super witchy date, so it's very easy to remember. Uh, you can find me like always on Twitter, and I'm sorry about that, and it's just at Alex E. Hero. Love it. Uh, Constance. Yeah, um, so I have a new book coming out in March uh, 2021. It's called Ladies of the Secret Circus, and it further explores um, demons and women with magical powers in a, in a dark circus in Paris uh, in 1925. So uh, you can find me Twitter, Instagram, and uh, at, Con at, at Constance Sayers and ConstanceSayers.com. Perfect. Uh, Alexis. Uh, my book, The Year of the Witching, is out now, uh, and stay tuned for some more info, maybe hopefully soon, on the sequel. Um, but for now, you can find me on Twitter at Alex H. Writes or on Instagram at Lexis H. Love it. Uh, Sophie? 
Uh, so my book, The Witches of Brooklyn, is out since September 1st, and I'm working on the second one right now, coloring it. So it should be out next fall, hopefully, if, uh, if my kids stay, remain in school. <laughs> And you can find me, I'm most active on Instagram. You can find me at Ezofi, E-S-O-F, and 3-I. Perfect. And Maggie. Uh, Mermaid, the Witch in the Sea is available for sale now, and I highly recommend buying between five and a thousand copies to build a fort <laughs> out of. Um, the sequel just got announced, so I'm almost done drafting that. And uh, you can find me on Twitter at E-M-T-E-E-H-A-L-L. -L. Uh, and if you like stories about girls uh, being vindictive and seeking revenge, I have a graphic novel called Squad coming out next year about teenage girls who Yay! turn into werewolves Yay. and eat Sounds bad boys. <laughs> <laughs> very much up my alley. Uh, thank you so, so much to everyone who joined us today for this lovely panel all about witches, witchiness, women doing cool stuff. Um, and lastly, again, I'm Lily Herman. I was your moderator and you can find me on Twitter at LK Herman. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.